in a quiet, unassuming corner of the American Southeast, in the boggy, sun-drenched wetlands of the Carolinas, lives a plant that seems to follow a different set of rules for life, a photosynthetic creature that has evolved against all odds to become an active and calculating predator. I'm Megan Brame, and on this episode of The History of Plants, we're investigating the Venus flytrap. It's a plant that hunts. And its discovery by the Western world was not just a curiosity, it was a crisis, a biological riddle that challenged the very foundations of natural law and set the stage for one of science's greatest debates, from being declared a carnivorous vegetable to an obsession for the great Charles Darwin. This iconic pop culture monster is more than just a pretty mouth, but now a fragile icon in desperate need of our help. Warning, we're talking about a carnivorous plant today. Some footage includes its food succumbing to the trap. Nature is metal, and viewer discretion is advised. The story of the Venus flytrap begins in a landscape of paradox. Its native range is extraordinarily small, growing naturally only within about a 75-mile radius of Wilmington, North Carolina. It thrives in a seriously hostile environment of acidic, waterlogged bogs with soil so poor in nitrogen and phosphorus that it would starve a normal plant. But this is no normal plant, and this is no accident. The impoverished soil is the first clue in our mystery, showing how environmental pressure can force a plant to find a radical, almost unbelievable solution to survive. Long before European naturalists laid their eyes on it, the indigenous peoples of the region, particularly the Cherokee Nation, knew the plant and respected its power. They called it Yiguiglu. They didn't see it as a biological anomaly, but a potent hunting medicine. Cherokee fishermen would chew a piece of the root and spit it on their bait, believing the plant's inescapable essence would prevent a fish from getting off the hook. The first documented encounter by a European reads like a dispatch from another world. In 1759, Arthur Dobbs, the colonial governor of North Carolina, described the plant to English botanists as, quote, a kind of catch fly, sensitive which closes upon anything that touches it. This letter sparked a flurry of excitement across the Atlantic. The famed Philadelphia botanist John Bartram became obsessed, nicknaming it Tippetawitchet, uh, which is a euphemism for female genitalia. The trap's two lobes, fringed with eyelash-like cilia, were seen as visually suggestive, and historians analyzing Bartram's letters think this quirky body nickname was used privately among the small all-male network of naturalists who were first studying it. Live specimens were priceless, and after several failed attempts, they finally arrived in England in 1768. There, the naturalist John Ellis was the first to study it in detail, correctly deducing its carnivorous nature and giving it its grand scientific name, Dionea muscipula. Dionea for the mother of the goddess Venus, and muscipula, Latin for mousetrap. But this discovery was not merely a new entry into the catalog. It was a philosophical bomb that threatened to shatter the very foundations of 18th century biology. To truly understand the scandal, we have to first understand the rigid mindset of the era. Back then, science and theology were intertwined, and nature was viewed as a divine, unchanging hierarchy called the Great Chain of Being. In this worldview, which stemmed from Aristotle, everything had a fixed place. Animals were granted movement and the power of predation. Plants were on a lower rung, silent, still, and created to be a source of food. This is the intellectual world that the Venus flytrap crashed into. The man who first tried to formally introduce it was John Ellis. In 1768, he sent specimens to the titan of botany and the father of taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus, excitedly detailing his observations of its active hunting nature. He expected praise. What he got was a crisis. Linnaeus was a trip, and definitely a fascinating product of his time. He was a devout Lutheran and the premier botanist of his era. And in his mind, these two roles were one and the same. He saw his work not as questioning nature, as some other scientists were branded in their lives, but instead as revealing the divine logic and order of God's handiwork. His task, as he saw it, was to be, quote, God's registrar, meticulously cataloging every species on earth into a perfect, unchanging system that reflected the mind of its creator. So 
for Linnaeus, this new plant wasn't just a botanical curiosity or a real cool shiny object. It was an attack on his life's work. A plant that behaved like an animal was chaos, potentially showing that the divine rules he had based his work on weren't so divine after all. He wholesale rejected Ellis's conclusions, declaring the plant's actions to be against the God-given order of nature. He argued it must be an accident and that it was not consuming flies, but simply giving them a place to rest during a rainstorm. Yes, that was his argument. If the fly got caught in the trap, that was just an oopsie. It was just an accident. And this magnanimous fly trap would set the fly free shortly. Since Linnaeus was essentially the bottleneck for getting a plant recognized and on the official taxonomic record, no one dared to question his theories about the Venus flytrap. So it remained nothing more than, quote, a miraculous vegetable for a century, a beautiful monster that broke the rules without a clear motive. The case of the impossible discovery was left open. It was a puzzle waiting for a detective with the patience and the brilliance to finally solve it. Carl Linnaeus died on January 10, 1778, leaving the flytrap's botanical anomalies nothing more than the equivalent of a parlor trick without a clear explanation. But that all changed in the mid-19th century with a scrappy little detective who took up the cause. His name was Charles Darwin, and he became utterly fixated on solving the mystery of the Venus flytrap. Darwin's deep dive into the flytrap began thanks to his stumbling on a common sundew, which is a sticky carnivorous plant near his home in Kent, England. I think sometimes people see a portrait of Darwin and think he was, you know, like a stuffy loner or a grouch with a giant beard and, you know. And while it's true, he became a little more socially isolated later in his life due to chronic health issues. During this time that we're talking about, he was known to be exceptionally affable personable and was considered a kind collaborator who kept up with fellow botanists around the world. One particular correspondent was Dr. William Marriott Canby, a Delaware-based botanist. Around 1868, Dr. Canby sent Darwin a package containing multiple living Venus flytraps. This was like the best care package ever because it changed Darwin's mild curiosity, turning it into a full-blown obsession. And when I say obsessed, I am not exaggerating. Darwin spent years of his life dedicated to carnivorous plants, a subject that culminated in his 1875 book, Insectivorous Plants. He filled his greenhouse with them, conducting meticulous experiments where he fed them tiny morsels of raw meat, cheese, and egg, documenting their every move. This wasn't just a side project. For Darwin, the Venus flytrap was a perfect miniature theater showcasing the power of natural selection, and he was its most dedicated audience. In a letter to Dr. Canby, he captured the plant perfectly, calling it, quote, a most wonderful plant. You see, he wasn't just interested in the why. He wanted to know how. How does a plant with no muscles or nerves achieve a speed and sophistication that rivals its animal prey? The answer lies in a masterful integration of clever physics, complex chemistry, and a shocking level of biological intelligence. So let's break it down, starting with the trap itself, which is a highly modified leaf. The two lobes are fringed with stiff interlocking teeth called cilia, and on the inner surface of each lobe, arranged in a precise triangle, are three tiny ultra-sensitive trigger hairs that act like sophisticated biological tripwires. And here's the first layer of the plant's genius. It can count. A single touch from a raindrop won't spring the trap. The plant registers at first touch, puts itself on high alert, and just waits. For the trap to snap shut, a second touch must occur within about 20 seconds. This two-step verification ensures the plant only expends energy on something that is moving, most likely making that a tasty living meal. The snap action itself happens in less than a tenth of a second and is a stunning display of biomechanics known as snap buckling instability. In its open state, the trap's lobes hold a huge amount of stored elastic energy like a loaded spring. The second trigger sends an electrical signal that causes a rapid shift in water pressure inside the leaf, making the lobes 
instantly flip their curvature. This then releases all of that stored energy at once, slamming the trap shut with an incredible speed and force. It's the equivalent of those metal clicker or popper lids on like jam jars or Snapple bottles. That small circular dome is stable when it's popped up and it's stable when you press it down. But the movement between these two states is almost instantaneous. The flytrap has harnessed that same principle of rapid geometry-based movement. I'm not a scientist, but to me, this is a brilliant fusion of biology and physics, using weaponized geometry to achieve a speed that rivals animals. Uncovering these kind of hidden, mind-bending mechanisms in the plant world is exactly what we do here. So, if you find this stuff as cool as I do, now's a great time to make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss the next investigation. But the plant's intelligence doesn't stop with the snap. The struggling of the trapped prey provides more stimuli to the trigger hairs, and the plant continues to count. After the fifth touch the trap begins to secrete its cocktail of powerful digestive enzymes, turning the sealed trap into a stomach. And this isn't just a generic acid. It is a highly specialized soup containing proteases to break down proteins for nitrogen and, crucially, chitinases, which are enzymes specifically designed to dissolve the tough chitin exoskeleton of an insect so that the plant can get inside the soft tissues. The more the victim struggles, the more digestive juices the plant releases. It assesses the size of its meal and allocates its resources accordingly. It's kind of like that scene in Who Framed Roger Rabbit with the shoe, equal parts horror show and impeccably fast chemistry. Um, sorry to re-traumatize you. So Darn had brilliantly explained why the trap existed, but he could only guess at its origin stories. Where did this complex weaponized leaf actually come from? That was a puzzle he couldn't solve with the tools of his time. Today, however, modern genetics has finally read the blueprint, and the story it tells is even stranger than Darwin could have ever imagined. You see, the Venus flytrap's ancestor was not a snap trap at all, but a much simpler carnivorous plant with a sticky flypaper trap, much like its living cousin, the sundew. About 70 million years ago, a crucial gene duplication event gave the plant essentially a spare genetic code to experiment with. Over millennia, it repurposed genes that were meant for roots to absorb nutrients in its leaves and turned self-defense genes into digestive ones. The final snap trap mechanism evolved most likely around 48 million years ago, giving the plant a huge advantage. It could now catch much larger prey than its sticky cousins, unlocking a richer source of nutrients in its impoverished environment. This entire incredible history is written in the plant's genes, but it's the visible result, the animated hunting leaf, that would go on to capture the human imagination, becoming one of our most iconic monsters. The flytrap's journey into pop culture began actually in the Victorian era. Darwin's scientific spotlight ignited a public fascination with this, quote, most wonderful plant. Wealthy collectors in England and Europe sought it out, cultivating it in their greenhouses and wardian cases, where it stood as a living testament to the strange, exotic wonders of the New World. But its predatory nature was also deeply unsettling and was further amplified by fiction writers inspired and horrified by Darwin's findings. Darwin's 1875 book was a scientific work, but his descriptions of the flytrap's process were so vivid and so visceral. He wrote of, quote, smotherings, crushings, and drownings, that he unintentionally provided the perfect source material for a Victorian Gothic horror. It wasn't just a specimen. It was becoming a character. The character's most famous role, of course, would arrive a century later, not in a greenhouse, but on the stage, no cultural artifact has done more to shape the public's perception of the Venus flytrap than the 1982 musical and the 1986 movie Little Shop of Horrors. Pedantic note, the original Little Shop of Horrors movie was in 1960 and featured a Venus flytrap-ish type of plant. Still, I'd argue the 1980s versions are way more famous. The character of Audrey too a man-eating plant from outer space with a thirst for human blood, is the flytrap's most enduring and exaggerated legacy. It's like Bruce with Jaws, you know? Audrey too embodies the real shocking traits of the Venus flytrap, its active trap and consumption of flesh, but takes them to monstrous proportions, making it sentient, manipulative, and terrifying. 
Also awesome. Through catchy songs and dark humor, Little Shop of Horrors cemented the image of the Venus flytrap in our minds, not just as a carnivore, but as a monster. But here's where the story gets truly strange, blurring the line between B-movie horror and biological reality. While a Venus flytrap can't eat a whole person, scientists have recently proven that it can digest human tissue. In a 2023 study, German researchers fed the plant cultivated human cancer cells. They found that the trap's potent cocktail of enzymes successfully broke down the cells, and the plant absorbed its nutrients. So, the idea of a man-eating plant, it turns out, is not entirely fiction, but it's still not going to eat you whole. At least not yet. Once it became a famous monster, with a hint of, you know, like scientific truth to the legend, you started to see its influence everywhere. In the world of video games, the piranha plant from Nintendo's Super Mario Brothers series is a direct and iconic homage to the flytrap with its toothy snapping jaws emerging from pipes to become one of the most recognizable villains in gaming history. In movies and television, the Venus flytrap is now a visual shorthand with like a quick way to establish a setting as exotic and mysterious or dangerous. This transformation into a pop culture monster cemented the Venus flytrap's global fame. But that fame has become a double-edged sword, creating a new kind of threat. Not a fictional one on stage and screen, but a real-world danger that puts the plant's very survival at risk. The double-edged sword of fame is the final and most urgent chapter in this Venus flytrap story. Its journey from a scientific curiosity to a global icon created a massive demand that its tiny native habitat could never sustainably meet. It's fighting a battle on two fronts, and it needs our help as soon as possible. The first and most significant threat is habitat loss. Remember, the Venus flytrap is a hyperendemic species native only to a small patch of coastal North and South Carolina. As that region develops, the unique boggy wetlands it needs to survive are drained for housing and agriculture. Also, that ecosystem's health depends on periodic fires to clean out taller competing vegetation. With human settlement comes fire suppression, which allows the forest to grow dense and shade out the sun-loving flytraps. Its tiny home is shrinking and changing. The second human threat is more direct, poaching. The plant's celebrity has fueled a shadow trade of illegally harvesting wild plants for sale. This is incredibly destructive, as poachers often target the largest, healthiest plants, which are most valuable for the population's survival. For years, wildlife officers have found poachers with hundreds, sometimes thousands, of stolen plants stuffed into pillowcases. The problem became so severe that in 2014, North Carolina elevated flytrap poaching from a $50 misdemeanor to a felony that could cost you 25 to 39 months in prison per plant. To be fair, most prison sentences go for only 6 to 17 months, but still, just leave these guys alone, okay? But this story doesn't end in tragedy. A dedicated coalition of conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy and state agencies are fighting to protect this fragile wonder. They manage vast preserves such as the Green Swamp and conduct controlled prescribed burns to mimic the natural fire cycles that this ecosystem needs. And most importantly, they've partnered with reputable nurseries to combat poaching. Through modern tissue culture, hundreds of thousands of Venus flytraps are now grown ethically and sustainably in labs. This satisfies market demand, making it so that there's no reason reason for anyone to ever buy a wild poached plant. And in the end, that is the Venus flytrap's modern paradox. A plant famed for being a monster, a vicious predator from a bee movie, is in reality an incredibly fragile species utterly dependent on one tiny unique habitat on Earth. Its story is a journey from a botanical blasphemy to a scientific marvel, from pop culture monster to a symbol of conservation. It is a living, breathing testament to the weird and wonderful power of evolution and a profound reminder of our responsibility to protect the impossible, wonderful discoveries in our own backyard. I'm Megan Brame. Thank you for joining me on another episode of The History of Plants. Jump into the commentary episode on Patreon. And a quick heads up for everyone, we are getting incredibly close to our next big community goal of 10,000 subscribers. As soon as we cross that finish line, I will be releasing the special bonus episode I've been working on all about strange carnivorous plants. If you want to help unlock that episode and be part of the celebration, now is the perfect time to hit the subscribe button because we are almost there. Until next time, greenies, stay curious and don't forget to flourish.